a lot of the process with writing this book, um, going through the last year of my life in this mindset of being unattached to the outcome has been a process of letting go, um, accepting life in the present and accepting the sort of absurdity and, and beauty of the everyday when there isn't really um, a, a future that you can count on. Cancer in the breast, the doctor from the biopsy says, one small spot, one small spot. I repeat it to John, who steps out of a breakout session when he sees my text. I repeat it to my mom, who says, you've got to be kidding me, not you already. I repeat it to my dad, who shows up at my house with chicken soup. I repeat it to my best friend, Tita, and she repeats it to me as we sit on the couch, obsessing over all 20 words of the phone conversation with the doctor. I repeat it brushing my teeth in the carpool line, unclasping my bra, falling asleep, walking the aisles of the grocery store, walking on the greenway, lying in the cramped, clanky cave of the MRI machine while they take a closer look. One small spot. It becomes a chant, a rallying cry. One small spot is fixable. One small spot is a year of your life. No one dies from one small spot. John Duberstein, the husband of author and poet Nina Riggs, reads from her newly published work, The Bright Hour, a literary legacy of a life cut short by breast cancer. Nina died in February at just 39, leaving behind two sons, Freddie 10 and Benny 7. In her final months, Nina, who happens to be the great-great-great-granddaughter of Ralph Waldo Emerson, gathered all her thoughts, fears, frustrations, and hopes for her young family feverishly writing The Bright Hour against the dying of her own light. I was just blown away because she not only was letting me read it in real time, so I was getting to see myself develop as a character and our children develop as characters in her book, but, um, but the things that she was writing about were real time. So it would be something that had just happened three or four days ago, and she would hand me the completed draft of a version of those events that she had woven into the, to the narrative of The Bright Hour, um, and that's partly, I think, um, it's maybe the one or two uh, most astonishing things I, for me about what she did. Because I'm sort of, I'm one of her biggest acolytes and biggest fans, and I just love her work even before she wrote um, this book. But, um, but I just can't believe she was able to do that in real time. Nina wrote a modern love column for the New York Times called When a Couch is More Than a Couch. It went viral, and with the encouragement of her literary agent, Nina turned it into a book. Um, I mean, I love the, the part in the article where she's talking about, um, I think she compares me, you know, she starts using the language of the couch to describe me. Um, so it lends itself to that kind of um, naturally just because of the descriptive nature of furniture and texture and um, color and all of that stuff. But it was also a way for her to focus nervous energy while she was sick. I mean, she, she had this, this tremendous diagnosis she was at loose ends almost the whole time. I mean, anytime you're going through something like this in treatment or, or when you're going through diagnosis, you're waiting for the next doctor's appointment. You're waiting for the next, you know, you want clarity, you want finality, you want, you know, to finally be able to understand what's going on. And of course you never do. You don't ever get to the point where you've got all the information that you need. Um, at some point you just have to be in the moment and be and do the thing that you're doing. And I think that's where the couch piece really resonates is, at some point, you just have to buy the couch. You just have to say, um, you know, I've found the right one. This is the one. This is going to be my couch. Kelly Corrigan, who wrote a blurb on the back of the book, said, how a woman can have this much emotional clarity and narrative power while fighting for her life should astonish every last one of us. It seems to me it would take incredible fortitude, courage, and grace to be able to deal with such a devastating diagnosis, a terminal illness, and at the same time, write so eloquently about it. Yeah. And with a sense of humor as well. Yeah, yeah, I know. How I'm, was she able to do that? I think she felt like she was sort of hurtling through this space of a cancer diagnosis and losing her mom and dealing with having young kids and all of this stuff, and it didn't feel particularly graceful or particularly like she had it all under control. Just six months after Nina was diagnosed with breast cancer, her mother passed away from multiple myeloma. In many ways, John says her mother was a role model for Nina on how to face her impending death. 
her mom was a dealer. She was a, let's talk about this, let's pull this out and hold it up to the light and um, check it out from every angle and make sure we understand what's going on. And that was true whether it was, you know, vacation plans or dying of cancer. So um, I think in some ways she was an apprentice to that and, and, um, and you know, furthered that. Nina actually starts the book with a quote from her mom that says, dying is not the end of the world. <laughs> Her mom was really glib and funny and, and, you know, really a lot of Nina's sense of humor, I'm sure, derives from her mom. But it doesn't, the world doesn't stop. In fact, if you have young kids or a spouse or an ailing parent or a healthy parent, all of those lives and their interactions keep happening right around you. And you can shut down, I suppose, but she and her mom totally rejected that. Um, Nina's whole mission in learning to cope with the diagnosis and the course of disease was not to let any of those things um, go and not to shut down on any of those levels. The, the being a mom, the being a wife, the being a friend, all of those things, even the hard parts, even the difficult parts, um, she, really, she really craved and wanted to keep doing them. It must feel as if she's still with you because you have her words to look at and her memory to talk about and her life to really celebrate. Yeah, I, the, I mean, it's, it almost seems like a cliche to me now to say it, but it's so true. The book is just an amazing, amazing legacy that she left for us. Um, my kids keep asking me when they're gonna get to read it, when do we get to read Mom's book, and I'm, I'm trying to work that out. I don't know when they're gonna be old enough to do it, but for me, um, yeah, it's like she left me all of the stuff that she had processed and condensed about facing terminal disease, about our relationship, about our family. It's, I, I don't know how much more I could ask for in terms of her death not leaving loose threads. You know, I have this tome that I can consult and, um, and, and really feel like I'm sort of in a conversation with her, still sort of have her around.